What's up, Meta Nerds? This complete breakdown of the A-Series Assassin Droid will pull from every source available to completely understand this obscure unit. The fascinating story actually begins during the Old Republic era with its creator Pollux Poi, a male angst engineer of renowned brilliance and rumored insanity who took a commission from the Shell Huts to craft assassin droids to combat the Genjali Kajidik. Enhanced with the ancient intelligence of the Builder IV Junkashik, these droids successfully eliminated Huts ranking 3rd through 14th in the Genjali clan succession line. In retaliation, the Genjali enlisted the Shade Shadow Killers to target Poi, forced into hiding within the depths of Kashyyyk's Shadowlands for two decades. Something that would have impressed the strongest of the native Wookiees, Poi, in what he termed the Shadow Game, evaded the Deshade with his droid creations serving as his protectors. The Deshade's pursuit ceased during the destruction of the Kron Cluster during the Great Sith War, and Poi later died of natural causes shortly after this Shadow Game ended. But his legacy endured as his droids evolved into the A-Series Assassin droids after discovering a primeval machine in Kashyyyk's forests, but their legacy endured with the help of that Builder Forge. Evolving into the A-Series assassin droids we see today, abandoned by their late master, the droids stuck together and this small droid family all agreed to allow the ancient Rakata intelligence to start an overhaul and replication of this modified line that took it from the original to what we see today. Standing at a height of 2.4 meters or 7 feet 11 inches, it was taller than most battle and assassin droids out there. Its blaster cannon is about as strong as a B2, while its grip is reported to be able to crush through other droids in light armor, while the tips of the fingers all had retractable finger blades, and we get the cryptic, quote, other weapons listed as being packed into this unit not including the blaster rifle that most would carry slung on their shoulders, as like the commandos, these units were capable of acting as snipers. While others have been known to use just about everything from flechettes, sonic detonator launchers, flamethrowers, hard sound guns, which are somewhat like the sonic blasters used by Geonosians, handheld tractor beam projectors, and vibroblades. Those flechettes, flames, and sound weaponry were all excellent against force users, as this was created at a time when there were massive armies of both Jedi and Sith. Though the galaxy was not at war with legions of force wielders anymore, their story does get weirder as they moved out to the Gri Enclave, one of the most remote areas of space in the Outer Rim. Named for the enigmatic Gri species, which was one of the only species that had a history that dated back to before the Rakata. In exchange for their assassination services, they hoped to gain more secrets from the ancient alien civilizations, likely seeking immortality, preserving their digital lives indefinitely. As nearly 4,000 years later, Count Dooku would encounter them in the obscure Gri sector, in his efforts to maneuver the pieces for his lord in the coming Clone Wars. Once the war was ignited, the Battle of Jabin would be one of the most chaotic and bloody, and after the fighting dragged on and the miserable, muddy terrain, which brought out prototypes of the AT-AT and other Republic walkers, against the elite Nimbus commandos, when scores of battle droid infantry, tanks, and other CIS vehicles could not finish the fight. Dooku sent in a flotilla of C9979s full of A-Series droids. Their leader gave a cold introduction, saying, quote, We are designed to disassemble over 11,000 sentient species and have been modified specifically for duty on Jabim, then confirming that their primary programming is for assassination. On the 39th day of fighting, Hailfire droids rained down rockets, and as these ancient droids rushed in, some would be cut down by the sabers, but it wasn't long before their blasters took the life of a force wielder, something they had not done for over four millennia. By day 42, they tried to trap the Chosen One, but a quick Quick saber thrown from a speeder bike was able to slash through four of them before he crashed his speeder into the fifth and leapt over to slash through the sixth, where the seventh tried desperately to keep up the fight, even after sparking through a photoreceptor, but the slam of a boulder onto its back finally turned the lights off. Though Anakin made his skirmish look easy, he knew the truth was that these A-Series reinforcements on top of the local support from the Jabimi loyalists, as well as just the standard droid units, it was simply too much and Anakin was wise enough to see that the closest thing to a victory would be a safe retreat. And this was considered a major Republic loss in the first year of the war. Later, Ventress would deploy 18 of them in her attack against Yoda and the forces defending Findar Spaceport. And for the expected counterattack, there was a large contingent defending the Separatist field headquarters on Vajun, but showing off their independent minds, with a longer history of operating as mercenaries outside of the Clone Wars context. We see that decades after the fall of the Empire, there were still a large number of them working to secure Jabim alongside the native Nimbus commandos. And so I hope you see this as truly one of the strangest histories of any droid unit. As for behind the scenes facts, 
Vax, there's an interesting detail from the novel Yoda Dark Rendezvous that says the A-Series units rolled down the hall and unpacked into their combat stance like a droidica. This isn't shown anywhere else in the comic. And though that does sound unique, it doesn't really look like the rest of their design makes sense for this. One connection could be that the Colicoids helped in their overall design, or later iterations during their time in the Gree Enclave, with the Colicoid creation nest being very active during the Old Republic era and being in the Outer Rim, that might make sense, but really the simplest is so easily overlooked because the Ankh species is relatively obscure. Like humans, Pollux just made these things in his image. As you can see, their heads are very similar. And honestly, it's sad to see that this is one of those many Star Wars creations that was just abandoned, with really cool lore and build-up with these ancient alien connections and running around the galaxy as an autonomous, mercenary band of droids, in the context that these droid units gain a sense of self the longer they go without a memory wipe. And they just look cool, and would have added to the richness of the galaxy, interacting with all sorts of factions, especially now in canon with the droid Gotra. As for the sources, most come from the Star Wars Republic series comics, the Battle of Jabim issues 55 through 58. They do appear in the mobile Battlefront games, called the Pollux Droids, which is again just so weird how serious they took this lore for there to be so little material on them. And though their head is a bit otter shaped, which again is just weird that there's such an obscure nod to the creator of these droids, even if the head is different and there's slightly different armor, with none of the built in weapons, but these are said to be A series Pollux Droids. Then other details come from the new Essential Guide to Droids, Clone Wars Campaign Guide, and Galaxy at War. Please hit that like button, it's the best way to help me out. Subscribe to see more, and check out these videos, I'm sure you'll like them. But most important of all, remember, there should be a Pollux Poi Award for droids, seeing if anybody else could create something that could keep you alive in the underworld of Kashyyyk for two decades. And the Force will be with you, always.